And we can't teach an animal anything in fear. Right? We can't learn in fear. So how, do you, so how would you get them? You can't take a child to a bowl. I mean, you can't. Right. right? So you, and you can't use a child, put a child in a room and let them get used to the child. You can, but you shouldn't. Right. <laughs> so, so what would you propose for that? Well, with children, the first thing I always do is, is starting with children, you know, I bring the dog into the room personally, and I make sure the dog has something positive, a positive experience, either me giving the dog treats, me playing tug with the toy, me bringing the dog near the child and then going away, and teaching the dog his flight ability. That means come near the child, look at me, good, I take it away. No dog can be trained by someone they don't have a relationship with, right? Everything with dogs, because of our co-evolution with them, is based on trust. So I can go to the shelter and immediately start working with the dog, because the first thing I do is I start very neutral, and I'll start with treats or something, so the dog goes, oh, this guy's a good guy. Now I'm going to expose you to something that you might not like. But I see people all the time, they take a dog out. There's two organizations, I was just going to say their name, but we're filming this, and I don't want to do that, um, that had these temperament tests. They would assess the temperament of a dog by a stranger taking the dog into a room, tying, back tying the dog, which, which creates negative um, resistance already, already, and teasing the dog with wet food, and then putting a plastic hand in the food and taking it away, and seeing if the dog would bite. And if the dog bit, they'd kill the dog. Right? I understand the theory that I don't want a dog biting my hand if I put my hand in the food bowl, but I don't understand the approach. Right? I mean, just put a, put a, put a, um, a broom handle in, the dog will bite the broom handle. You, know, you can put a stapler in, the dog will bite the stapler. It doesn't have to be a plastic hand. Because first of all, dogs don't see a plastic hand as a hand because it doesn't smell like a hand. Right? It doesn't really look like a hand, it looks like a plastic hand. But dogs are going on the first thing they have, which is their sense of smell. Latex smells different than human skin, unless you wear latex gloves. Right? So, yes, Professor. Back to correction and punishment. Mm -hmm. when, when you came a few weeks ago and spoke to my animal behavior class, you showed us the electric collar that mm -hmm. you use on your dog, mm -hmm. and we, like, I held it, and yeah. it feels very unpleasant, mm -hmm. but not painful. But is that correction or is that punishment? It's correction. That's correction. Yeah. Now, it can be used as punishment. So any tool, for example, my hand. I always say of all the tools that exist in the world, of dog training tools, the cruelest one is your mind, the second cruelest is your hand. Right? Electric collars, pinch collars, choke chains, none of them are cruel unless our mind determines we will use them as cruel tools and we put that knowledge into our hands and start hurting the dog with that tool. Right? So the electric collar, and the reason I brought that out is because it's such a controversial subject. If I, put that call, if I put that in your hand and turn it up to 100 and hit it, it would scare the daylights out of you. Right? But what did I do? I started at 1, then 2, then 3. And when we got to 4 or 5, Javier said, oh, that's a little uncomfortable. Right? But we want to look at the degree of discomfort from that compared to the discomfort of a dog chasing a child and ending up in the shelter the dog being disobedient and running out a gate and getting hit by a car, the dog um, doing whatever it is. And as, as the Tao, the Chinese Book of Wisdom says, to know the small things in the grand things and the grand things in the small things. So all knowledge that you have, as, as intelligent as every one of you is here, a college student, you're doing something very basic. You're taking a pencil and putting it on paper and drawing little letters. That's the small things. The grand things is the knowledge that you're imparting into the book that you're writing. So you must know both. You can't do one without the other. There has to be a greater picture. And for the dog, it is to know that if I say stay, and the dog breaks the stay, that that's just, and the person says, well, it's not a big deal. I mean, he's just moving. God bless you. There's no difference between that dog breaking the stay there when I told him to stay when there was no distraction than the dog breaking the stay if he's chasing a child, running across the street, or running out of my gate and getting hit by a car. But we want to myopically think that, well, but why would we use it in this little thing? Because dogs learn through imprinting. Imprinting and luring and shaping. So if I teach a dog with a piece of treat to do this and to get next to me, the dog learns that's the position to get in. When I take this treat away and I only tie the word to it, the dog will follow that. And that is how we condition a dog to learn. Simply, we pursue pleasure, we avoid pain. 
And we must, of all things, understand the difference between punishment and corrections. Punishments are punitive, egotistical, and bring about no way for the dog to solve the problem of what he did wrong. Corrections clearly block the behavior of what you are doing or about to do that is incorrect and teach you to shape the behavior to a desired behavior that will then bring you reward and allow me to give you that reward. In a nutshell, that is the way to condition any animal to learn quickly, whether it's a person or, or, or a mouse, to avoid pain. And pain, by the way, can be withholding a food for a day, two, three, four, and trainers will do that, by the way. If you look at the way um, animals are trained at SeaWorld, the reason they're working for the little fish isn't because that fish tastes better than the fish that they eat in the ocean. It's the only fish they've had that day, right? And some people who use food, and I've helped people with this, they've refused to use a negative, such as, and, and I don't know why it's even called negative, I'm saying negative because that's what people call it. Um, they refuse to use a pinch collar, so the dog will then be trained with positive-only methods, which they consider food. I would personally much rather have somebody put a pinch collar around my neck, put me into position, and give me and block a behavior that I'm about to do, than withhold food for two days, because I like to eat, you know, and then offer me little morsels of food. So the decision is really a personal choice, and it's something that we need to kind of come to grips with, that corrections are corrections, rewards are rewards. How we space them and how we give them to dogs is what makes the difference between what some people consider more positive training and what other people consider more a corrective-based approach. Every one of you here has taken a test, right? So if you got the question incorrect, did they just let it go? Or did they put a red X by it? Yes. Put a red X by it, right? And then later they said, oh, it's not B, it's D. Right? So they gave you a correction. So you would learn that 2 plus 2 isn't 6. It's 5. <laughs> it's four, you're right. God, thank God you're here. Good. <laughs> so any questions, um, any kind of, I'd like to kind of keep it an open discussion because I really enjoy your thoughts and, 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 and inviting those as a, as a topic of discussion as opposed to me just giving you my thoughts because I hear my thoughts all the time. <laughs> yes? I'm working on, we have a new dog that just turned a year yesterday and he's big and strong uh -huh. and a lot of work. When we're walking and we're trying to teach him to heal, mm -hmm. you give him the treat and he heals, mm -hmm. but about three seconds later he doesn't heal. Mm -hmm. And so the treats, he's very treat motivated, mm -hmm. but he it drops it a couple of seconds later. So right. What are you doing those situations? So first of all, treats go along the line of what's called prey drive, right? So that's the food. So when dogs work for food, they're working in prey and not in pack mode, right? So real simple, and it's kind of a complex discussion, but the reason the dog is healing, because he sees, there's a treat, there's a treat, there's a treat. I got the treat, yeah, 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 yeah. Here comes a treat, here comes a treat, here comes a treat. So he's almost being conditioned to do it as a game, right? So when we do competitive obedience dogs, what we do is hold the treat next to us, and we take the leash and put it behind us and have them nice and snug, and we do it, we only use the treat to condition the head to come up. So the dog will look, and then later I put the treats in my mouth and I spit the treats to the dog. To get the dog to follow us, I put an aversive in. So what I do is I, and every single person who tries to train a dog to walk on a leash uses a four foot leash and tries to get the dog to walk right next to him. But the dog has no reason to walk next to you because he doesn't care, right? He doesn't see any benefit in that. So what I always do is I give the dog an immense amount of freedom. So I start a dog on a 10 foot line. And as long as he's within 10 feet of me and I'm walking in the park, perfect. But what I start doing is when he goes beyond that 10 feet, I turn and walk the other way. And then he gets a correction on his neck, right? And then he walks with me, and then suddenly I'll walk this way. And if he doesn't pay attention, he gets a correction on his neck. And every time he shows up back next to me, there's no pressure on his neck. And I go, oh, that's a good boy. And I let him have his freedom. And then I turn this way. And then he gets a little correction on his neck because he's not paying attention to me. In order, when I get the dog to pay attention to me, I get a compliant dog who understands that pack behavior or staying with his pack is beneficial. In other words, if a, if a dog in the wild roams outside of his pack, he might get killed. So the pack needs to stay together. So we use that drive with a leash and we start with a 10 foot leash, then an eight foot leash, then a six foot leash, and then a four foot leash because we're closing the dog 
into an area, we're giving him a lot of freedom, but we're showing him the benefit of being close to us by making abrupt turns and turns and turns, and that he is correcting himself when he's not paying attention. If you put him next to you and, and hammer the dog with a leash, well, now you're just being aversive. So why would I want to be next to you if every time I'm next to you, you're yanking my neck? My goal is going to be to get away from you. Instead, what I'll do is correct the dog when he's 10 feet away, and when he's next to me, oh, there you are, good boy. And if you look at the videos of my dog, my dog walks on a perfect heel. He walks directly next. If I ask him to, if, he, if I don't ask him to, he's completely uh, a psychopath. You know. <laughs> but if I tell him a heel command, he'll walk right next to me no matter what's in the room. And I showed that at this. And that, and that seminar is, is on, on my YouTube channel as well. So you can see it there. Yeah, Professor. In animal behavior, we were talking this week about hormones and behavior. Mm -hmm. And we started talking today and we'll continue next Thursday talking about oxytocin. Mm -hmm. And this morning I had a conversation with a student that wanted to come to hear you but couldn't. And he wanted to ask about whether there is a, a release of oxytocin in humans when we are with dogs. Yes. That helps with bonding. Th there's been a, a stud an immense study on that that shows that humans and um, dogs release oxytocin when we're in proximity with dogs, when we're interacting, when we're cuddling, when we're petting them. That just us petting them releases oxytocin with us as well as with the dog. Yeah, it's a pretty fantastic study that we benefit. That's why that you say it lowers our stress levels, our cortisol levels go down when we pet our dogs, except if your dog's being naughty, then your cortisol <laughs> levels rise. But yeah, there's immense health benefits to that, and, and oxytocin is one of the ones that that, that study was published, I think, two or, th two or three years ago. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Does it matter the age of the dog that you train? No. Mm -mm. I mean, I can't take an older dog that's hardwired conditioned for certain things and turn it into a perfect dog. But we can always change the behaviors of the dog through bringing about reward and, uh, and teaching them to avoid co conflict. Remember, the biggest conflict dogs have is not physical stresses, but emotional stresses. So dogs release immense amounts of stress hormones. Right? When, when they're emotionally stressed. So if somebody keeps yelling at the dog, stop, sit, da, 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 you know, that's very negative to the dog. A physical correction, dogs recover from very, very quickly. Step on your dog's toe, right, which I've done many times, and say, oh my God, are you okay? And the dog will be, oh, oh, and oh my God, let me see the toe, and the dog's shaking, oh, oh. And he's either really emotionally stressed or he's just milking it for all it's got, right? <laughs> but more than likely, he's just, you know, he's kind of stressed because we're furthering that stress. On the flip side, I stepped on my dog's toe and he goes, ah! And I go, good boy, let's go over here. Within one second, it's like, oh, what was that? <laughs> but emotionally, we stress dogs by over putting our emotions, which the dog's not capable of dealing with. Their emotions stop at that two and a half year, you know, it's like take a two, year, two and a half year old child and put those other emotions of contempt, guilt, pride, all those onto that child. It's, it's abuse, right? And in my opinion, emotional abuse is equivalent to physical abuse, sometimes worse. Anybody? We should just go to lunch and keep talking. <laughs> I know, but, um, Shame. Uh -huh. I had a dog, and I think he felt shame when he did what he wasn't supposed to do, like when we were at home. Mm -hmm. But you said that, did you say that uh, dogs operate at, um, at about the age of a two-year-old child, but yeah. the shame is an emotion that develops later? Yeah, shame, they, the, according to studies, have shown that shame and guilt develop much later in, in in humans, and th so therefore we would e equate that similar to dogs. So sometimes dogs will like, they'll mess on the rug and we come home and go, but the, the, they're doing is the interaction between us and them, they're buying into, oh, he's upset, why is he upset? And, and it's a suspicion, you know, and it's, it's more, and suspicion as you see, oh, it's not here, but a suspicion um, happens early on, before six months, and we know dogs will, will trigger on suspicion. So if, if the dog pees on the rug and I come over and I go, what did you do right there? The dog's like, um, why are you acting like this? I'm suspicious, right? So yeah, more than likely it was suspicion than shame. Because with shame, he'd be like, he'd greet you at the door and go, hey. You know? But he's not doing that, right? He's, he's waiting till you get over. Because if you didn't pay attention to well, that. He would hide, right? 
right? Right. Because, so, you know, usually I come home and the dog comes and greets sure. me and he's happy. But when I come home and where's the, where's the dog? Right. And like, oh, he does something wrong. He's hiding under, right. under the table. And again, that may have been a learned behavior because of a response you had to that uh, thing he did previously. Okay. Yeah. So dogs are really simple to figure out, unlike humans. You know, I'd much rather figure out dogs than <laughs> people any day. So um, we've got about like, two minutes left, and I'd, I'd love to, if anybody has a quick question, comment. Um, if you have a question or something, you can always uh, visit my, all my social media. It's all under Robert Cabral or Robert Cabral Dogs and uh, Twitter, Instagram. There's a new video every single day on Instagram of something dog related. Cabral, C-A-B-R-A-L. Yeah, and follow me on Instagram, f Facebook, YouTube. There's tons of great information. I always welcome if you send in an email, quick question, you know, ask me anything. Um, I'll get to it. Sometimes it takes time because they get bombarded, but they're all free. Um, as much information as I can get to you guys about saving dogs, the better my life is. And thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone.